Okay. So we are in LaGuardia Airport actually, as I mentioned, waiting for a flight on which we are on standby. Hopefully we make it to the actual list of passengers. But uh, nevertheless... Oh, yeah, and one thing. Uh, today I'll be speaking in a British accent for the rest of the video, I guess. Okay, <laughs> very good with you. Um, hey, now, don't say my name. They'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my son says my son says that Lagardia is Walmart Dubai. It is pretty fancy for Lagardia, but he says it's Walmart Dubai. Okay. Okay. So this chapter by Hawking's book, uh, The Theory of Everything, is on black holes. Okay, is black holes, <laughs> and you can come closer and talk because it may not be recorded. Celebrities I could beat up, Stephen Hawking. Do you want to do a little of the rap, the Einstein uh, Hawking uh, rap? Can, can, can I come closer? So, and talk? The, okay, I'm gonna speak in an American accent because it's better. Um, British accents are bad. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, there's an epic rap battle of history, but between Einstein and Stephen Hawking, and basically what happens is. The funniest part. Einstein says, I'm the giant whose shoulders you'd have stood on if you could stand. I'll give you a brief history of pain with the back of my hand. Woo! Okay, continue. It's hilarious. Continue. Continue with the I don't answer. remember anything else. Oh, God. Okay. Oh, my bad. Sorry, Appa. Okay. I'm, I'm a very bad hey. child. Hey, cheap. <laughs> Somebody. Okay. That's going to be my signature uh, laugh. Now we'll continue with, uh, we'll with the chapter on I Black I have Holes. a philosophical question for you. Really? Are we real? You are not, okay? So That's not a good roast. Okay. Can we get to the book? Okay. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thanks. The, the term black hole is of very recent origin. It was coined in 1969 by the American scientist. Who is the American scientist? I think it's, uh, I think it's like... John... Oh, wait, wait, John... Uh, it's like John Marshall. No, John Chef Wheeler. Wheeler, yeah. John Gavin Wheeler. Wheeler. Okay, John Wheeler as a graphic description of an idea that goes back at least 200 years. At the time, there were two theories about light. One was that it was composed of particles. The other was that it was made of waves. We now know that really both theories are correct. By the wave-particle duality of quantum mechanics, light can be regarded as both a wave and a particle. Under the theory that light was made up of waves, it, is, it was not clear how it would respond to gravity. But if light were composed of particles, one might expect them to be affected by gravity in the same way that cannonballs, rockets and planets are. On this assumption, a Cambridge Dawn, John Mitchell... Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I, I just had a realization. So you know how they discovered uh, Neptune? Uh, they were looking for the um, what they thought would be the orbit of Uranus, and uh -huh. what? Okay. And uh, Uranus wasn't exactly orbiting there, so they realized that there must be an, an, according to the article I read yesterday, an enormous astronomical body, which which had a gravitational pull so strong, it was able to change the orbit, the orbit of Uranus. Okay. And that's how they discovered Neptune. Yep. That's right. And apparently Galileo, uh, uh, Galileo thought there was um, an uncharted star near Jupiter. So that's okay. so it's, and since the thing since the thing was moving the star, uh, the uncharted star, he actually thought it was um, he thought it was he might have thought it was a planet and maybe he was the first one to discover Neptune. Okay. I'm going to continue back on the black holes. Yeah, now. sure, sure. Okay. sure. On. on this assumption that uh -huh. light was particles, a Cambridge Don, John Mitchell, wrote a paper in 1783 in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. In it, he pointed out that a star that was sufficiently massive and compact would have such a strong gravitational field that light could not escape. I thought I confused John Mitchell and John Marshall earlier. Okay, and John Mitchell is the Don. A Any, dawn like the crime boss? <laughs> not like the crime boss. They're called Cambridge Dawns. I don't know why they gave them the name Dawn, but we should find that out. It will be, I'm sure. I think they're just crime bosses, okay. honest opinion. We will, we will find it out. Sure, sure. All okay. right, let's continue. Yeah. Um, any light emitted from the surface of the star would be dragged back by the Earth's gravitational attraction before it could get very far. 
Mitchell suggested that there must be a large number of stars like this. Although we would not be able to see them because the light from them would not reach us, we would still feel their gravitational attraction. Such objects are what we now call black holes because that is what they are, black voids in space. A similar suggestion was made a few years hey, but later. but how are they black voids if there's something inside them that sucks us towards Void, them? visible void. A visible, visual void. Yeah, but what yeah. is inside a black hole, like other than the singularity? What does the singularity do? What does it have inside it? That we will continue with the book and find out because anything I say is speculation. Yeah, then just make your speculations. No, I'm not going to make speculations. Hey, it's fun. No. I like speculations. Okay. Uh, inside the black hole is a giant tortoise sucking everything out. Okay? Yeah, I think I'm the tortoise, you know? Okay, okay. Now let's continue. A similar suggestion was made a few years later by the French scientist, the Marquis de Laplace, apparently independent of Mitchell. Interestingly enough, he included it in only the first and second editions of his book, The System of the World, and left it out of later editions, later editions. Perhaps he decided that it was a crazy idea. In fact, it's not really consistent to treat light like cannonballs in Newton's theory of gravity because the speed of light is fixed. Unlike the speed of other objects which can vary with gravitational force, uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the speed of light, light is fixed is by relativity. Photons are massless. Yes, they did not know that at that time, right? Because so they're NPCs. The, uh, uh, a cannonball fired upward from the Earth will be slowed down by gravity and will eventually stop and fall back. A photon, however, must continue upward at a constant speed. How then can Newtonian gravity affect light? A consistent theory of how gravity affects light did not come until Einstein proposed general theory in 1915. And even then it was, it was a long time before the implications of the theory for massive stars were worked out. To understand how a black hole might form, we need, to, we need an understanding of the life cycle of a star. A star is formed when a large amount of gas, mostly hydrogen, starts to collapse in on itself due to its gravitational attraction. As it contracts, the atoms of the gas collide with each other more and more frequently and at greater and greater speeds. The gas heats up. Eventually, the gas will be so hot when the hydrogen atoms collide, they no longer bounce off each other, but instead merge with each other to form helium atoms. What is this called? Fusion. Uh, Fusion. I have a question. Okay. I have a question. What is at the center of a black hole? Like, what atoms make up a black hole? <laughs> They're just basically, I think, protons and neutrons. I don't think it's any more atoms anymore. They're all crushed so much that it's beyond... So there, there is like an infinite series of hydrogen ions. Even worse than Because a hydrogen ion is just a single proton. Proton. Even worse than that, I think. I think the protons might also be broken into smaller particles, the quarks, and I don't know whether the quarks are uh, lighter uh, than protons. Uh, if you had a negative... How many quarks make up a proton? Uh, three. Three. Two yeah. up quarks and one down quark. Okay. Uh, I have a question. So if you had... What if you made water with the hydro uh, what if you made water with two hydrogen ions and an oxygen atom? It won't form like that. It needs to be formed uh, with the proper bonding in place. You can't form it with ions. I mean, that could be the precursor, but the final product has to be the water molecule the way it is. Otherwise, it wouldn't be stable. It'll break up easily. No. What if I uh, what if I took a water molecule and I removed two uh, and I removed an electron each from each hydrogen atom? The molecule would break down. Oh, yeah. Couldn't do that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Two, 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 two. Okay. I'm gonna continue. <laughs> okay? okay. Continue. To understand how a black hole might form, we need an understanding of the light. We did all this thing, so the gas heats up. Eventually, the gas will be so hot that when the hydrogen atoms collide, no they no longer bounce of each other, but See instead you. merge with each other to form helium atoms. The heat released in this reaction, which is like a controlled hydrogen bomb, is what makes the star shine. This additional heat also increases the pressure of the gas until it is sufficient to balance the gravitational attraction, the gas stops contracting. It is a bit like a balloon where there's a balance between the pressure in the air side 
which is trying to make the balloon expand and the tension in the rubber which is trying to make the balloon smaller. The stars will remain stable like this for a long time with the heat from the nuclear reactions balancing the gravitational attraction. Eventually when the stars will run out of its hydrogen and other nuclear fuels, eventually however the star will run out of its hydrogen and other nuclear fuels and para And paradoxically, the more fuel a, fuel a star starts off with, the sooner it runs out. This is funny. This is crazy. The more fuel a star starts off with, the sooner it runs out. This is because the more massive the star is, the hotter it needs to be to balance its gravitational attraction. And the hotter it is, the faster it will use up its fuel. Our sun prob has probably got enough fuel for another 5,000 million years or so, but more massive stars can use up their fuel in as little as 100 million years, much less than the age of the universe. When the star runs out of fuel, it will start to cool off and so, so to contract. What might happen to it then was only first understood in the end of the 1920s. In 1928, an Indian graduate student named Subramanian Chandrasekhar set oh, sail limit for neutron stars uh, white walls, set, right? stay, set sail for England to study at Cambridge with the British astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington. Eddington was an expert on general relativity. There is a story that a journalist told Eddington in the early 1920s that he had heard there were only three people in the world who understood relativity, general relativity. Eddington replied, I am trying to think who the third person is. What does he mean with you? He means the third person is himself. No. I'm trying to think who the third person is. This journalist says there are three people and Eddington says, I'm trying to think who the third person is. Who is the first person? Albert Einstein. Who is the second person? Himself. Yeah. He thinks that he's so full of himself that he thinks only Einstein and he understand general relativity. Who's the third person? Nobody. That's what I'm trying to think. I can't. No. He is basically saying there's no one else who understands it. That, please don't do that to the leg. We're being recording. Oh no. During his voyage from India, Chandrasekhar worked out how big a star could be and still separate itself against its own gravity after it had used up all its fuel. The idea was this. When the star becomes small, the matter particles get very near each other. But the Pauli exclusion principle says that no two matter particles can have both the same position and the same velocity. The matter particles must therefore have very different velocities. This makes them move away from each other and so tends to make the star expand. Mm. If you added the Pauli explosion principle and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, what would you get? Uncertain explosion principle? No. No, okay, what is it? Because the, the Pauli uncertainty principle. It says no two, um, no two particles can have the same location and velocity at the same time. And the, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that no particle uh, can have its position and uh, its velocity de uh, determined. So, I don't think the Pauli exclusion principle needs to exist. <laughs> That's a good point. It's a, a kind of, I, I'm sure the Pauli exclusion principle is it's a little bit... It's still the Heisenberg more. uncertainty principle, even if the Pauli exclusion principle exists. I, then you combine the two. I think it's so, a little deeper than that, but... Uh, I really, it's, it's, it's complicated, but I still don't think the Pauli exclusion principle should exist. It's useless. Like, if you can't determine the uh, time and uh, the speed and position of a particle, then why do you need to know the speed and position I, of I two have, particles? I have forgotten more about these things than I care to remember. But let you me tell you this thing. No one let me about let the me Pauli let me tell you something. Legions of scientists beg to differ. The Pauli exclusion principle is important. But yeah, I'll, 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 I'll destroy the Pauli exclusion principle. When you get to graduate school and if you're doing it in physics, please try doing that, okay? Until then, let's I'll read. i it with the goofy Arvin principle. Let me continue now. Um, 
A star can therefore maintain itself at a constant radius by a balance between the attraction of gravity and the repulsion that arises from the exclusion principle, just as earlier in, in its life the gravity was balanced by heat. That's interesting. Let me repeat it once again. A star can therefore maintain itself at a constant radius by a balance between the attraction of gravity and the repulsion that arises from the exclusion principle, just as earlier in its life the gravity was balanced by the heat. Chandrasekhar realized, however, that there is a limit to the repulsion that the exclusion principle can provide. The theory of relativity limits the maximum difference in the velocities of the matter particles in the star to the speed of light. This means that when the star got sufficiently dense, the repulsion caused by the exclusion principle would be less than the attraction of gravity. Chandrasekhar calculated that a cold star of more than about one and a half times the uh, mass of sun would not be able to support itself against its own gravity. This mass is now known as the Chandrasekhar limit. This has serious implications for the ultimate fate of massive stars. If a star's mass is less than the Chandrasekhar limit, it can eventually stop contracting and settle down to its possible final state as a white dwarf with a radius of few hundred miles, few thousand miles, and a density of hundreds of tons so per white cubic inch. Are smaller than the United States. Uh, a white dwarf is a three-dimensional object. United States is a two-dimensional surface. I mean, so, like if you put the United States on a planet, if you wrap the uh, if the, if you wrap the United States around, say Pluto, because Pl I'm pretty sure Pluto is smaller than Australia, but I need to check that out. Something again, about, you're comparing a surface no with that's a, the moon, not Pluto. But um, yeah, but if are I, you comparing surface areas of planets and surface areas of yeah, the United I am, States? I am. Okay. Okay. If I uh, took the United States and I wrapped it around the moon, and then I sl uh, and then I compared that to a white dwarf, I'm pretty sure the white dwarf wouldn't be much. What's bigger. the area of United States? Uh, 3.78 million square miles. 3.78 million square miles. Few thousand miles. Let's say that the radius is a uh, few thousand miles. What is 4 pi r square? That is, uh, you said three three point how many millions? 3.78 million. I think uh, the white dwarf will have a larger surface area because it's already few thousand. Let's say few thousand now. It's about two thousand now. Which way? So four pi r square will give you four three twelve twelve four twenty four twenty four million square miles. Okay, yeah, that's a that's little bigger. too big. That's about yeah. the size of Asia. Yeah. If not so, okay. Well, you're, you're after Asia. The whole continent. Shall we continue with this one? Yes, father. Okay. Um, if a star's mass is less than the Chandrasekhar limit, it can eventually stop contracting and settle down to a possible final state as a white dwarf with a radius of a few thousand miles and a density of hundreds of tons per cubic inch. A white dwarf is supported by the exclusion principle repulsion between the electrons in its matter. We observe that a large number of these we observe a large number of these white dwarfs. One of the first to be discovered is the star that is orbiting around Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. It was also realized that there was another possible state for a star also with a limiting mass of about one or two times the mass of the sun but much smaller than even the white dwarf. These, dwarfs, these stars would be supported by the exclusion principle between neutrons and protons rather than between electrons. These were therefore called neutron stars they would have had a radius of only 10 miles. That is smaller than the surface area. That's smaller than yeah. I think New York City. <laughs> Something like that. Yes, it is smaller than New York but State. I think it probably weighs more than New York City. And a I think density. It, no, wait, wait, wait. I think it probably weighs more than New York City, though. Like, if you took the entire column that New York City yes. is built on, the whole, like, a big bowl of New York City. Yeah. A neutron star would probably weigh more than that. And a density of hundreds of millions of tons per cubic inch. The white dwarf was hundreds of tons per cubic inch. This is hundreds of millions of tons per cubic Wait, inch. I have, a, uh, I have a question. What is that per atom? I'm joking. No, it's not per atom. It's per not cubic per inch, per volume. I know, but like if you if you kept going down in volume, down, down, down. You'll get down to an atom. Yeah, you can you can find out the volume but per atom. But wouldn't an atom weigh more? No, an atom wouldn't weigh more. And first of all, there wouldn't be any atoms in this case. It'd just be protons and neutrons. That's 
That's a bunch of hydrogen ions. Yeah, but That's neutrons are not. Ions. Neutrons are not. No, if, if uh, say it's in a nucleus, I think it, it's just a bunch of deuterium ions. Yeah, but these are completely stripped away protons and neutrons. Deuterium okay. cations. Okay. At the time that they were first predicted, there was no way that neutron stars could have been observed and they were not detected until much later. Stars with masses above the Chandrasekhar limit, on the other hand, have a big problem when they come to the end of their fuel. In some cases, they may explode or manage to throw off enough matter to reduce their mass below the limit. But it is difficult to believe that this always happened, no matter how big the star. How would it how would it know that it had to lose weight? And even if every star Overweight manages stars. To, I know. How and even if every star managed to lose enough mass, hey, th what would happen? Majoris is obese? Okay. <laughs> what would happen if you added more mass to a white dwarf for a neutron star to take it over the limit? Would it collapse to infinite density? Eddington was shocked by the implications of this and refused to believe Chandrasekhar's result. He thought it was simply not possible that a star could collapse to a point. This was the view of most scientists. Einstein himself wrote a paper in which he claimed that stars would not shrink to zero size. The hostility of other scientists, particularly of Eddington, his former teacher and the leading authority on the structure of stars, persuaded Chandrasekhar to abandon this line of work and turn instead to other problems in astronomy. However, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1983, it was at least in part for his early work on the limiting mass Wait, of when pole did stars. Go to, um, 1928, and he finished a good deal of his work before he even met Eddington with you on the voyage from India to Cambridge. It's pretty remarkable stuff. The most based Indian in human history. Yeah, really? we, need to, we need to make this guy more famous. Like all he I is. He is quite famous. He's, uh, I think we're, I, I think it's a small world here. We're only friends with scientists. <laughs> that is a good point. We are friends with more scientists and we meet people who are more of science, who are interested we're, in science. I barely know any people who aren't Indians. Like, it's kind of, oh, you most know. Indians know of Chandrasekhar because he's Indian. True. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop this one and we'll get back to the next part of this chapter yeah in guys a separate also file. always remember <laughs> that's my goofy y'all laugh bye guys